Hi, I'm Nick Sider. I'm a field crop entomologist with the University of Illinois. Welcome to our Illinois Extension Commercial Ag webinar series. I'm going to be talking about early season insect pests in corn and soybean, what to watch out for, a little bit about the biology of these insects, and especially how to manage early season insect pests as we go into 2020. Now, it's the middle of May. We've had a cold week or so uh, here in Illinois, and that has slowed down crop growth considerably in some areas. And when we have that situation, it kind of puts us on the lookout for some of these early season insect pests. Those cold temperatures don't necessarily favor the insects. In fact, usually they do the opposite. Usually they slow the insects down a little bit. However, when you have crop growth delayed, that gives those insect pests a little bit more time to sort of tee off on these vulnerable seedling stages of the crop. So that damage becomes more important, it becomes more pronounced, and it becomes something that we need to pay attention to and make sure that we manage correctly. So I'll be talking about early season pests of both corn and soybean, and to start off, we'll focus a little bit on corn. Begin talking about cutworms. So these are various caterpillars. Uh, in entomology, we like to name our pests after what they do, and so these are caterpillars that cut plants in many cases. And we have a few different species of cutworms that we deal with. Actually dealt with the variegated cutworm up here in the top right a uh, little bit last year, primarily in some fields that had maybe less than perfect uh, early season weed control and that were also planted a little bit late. I know that doesn't sound familiar to anybody from last year, but uh, that was the situation that many of us found ourselves in, and that can actually lead to problems with variegated cutworm. We see dingy cutworm, this one in the lower left, from time to time in Illinois. Uh, not something that we deal with on a, on a very regular basis, and um, not something that we worry about a whole lot, but we can have issues with dingy cutworm from time to time. Western bean cutworm, we're not really going to talk about today. That's actually a later season pest, despite the, the cutworm name. We're far more concerned with western bean cutworm once we have ear formation as an ear feeding caterpillar. Uh, so don't let that name confuse you. We're not worried about western bean cutworm early as a stand reducing pest. Now the one that we deal with by far the most commonly in Illinois is the black cutworm. Uh, this should be a familiar insect to most of you if you've been growing or scouting corn uh, for any amount of time in Illinois. This is one that we look out for really on a yearly basis, and it's not always a bad year for cutworm, uh, but this is really one of the first pests that we look for in corn in Illinois. In terms of the damage, you can see here the, the cutting damage that the larger adults do. When you have, excuse me, the larger larvae, when you have smaller larvae, that early damage is going to resemble rows of holes uh, going across the leaf or maybe some chewing um, on the leaf, similar to what other caterpillars, including corn borer larvae, including armyworm larvae, similar kind of damage. As those larvae develop, and especially when they hit the fourth instar when they're about half an inch or greater in size, they're then capable of cutting plants. So they'll actually feed right through the plant and cut it off at the base, as you can see here. Now that does two things. One, it can stunt the growth of the plant if it cuts it above the growing point, or can even kill the plant uh, if it's able to cut that plant below the growing point. So this can become a stand reducing pest, and that's where we're the most concerned with this. A little bit of defoliation that we get in early season corn, corn roars back from that pretty quickly. Uh, it's when we start to actually lose sand that we potentially have issues with cutworm and really with any of these early season pests that we're talking about today. One thing to note with cutworms, you're likely to see the damage before you see any of the larvae. So these larvae are nocturnal. Uh, like most caterpillars, they're going to do most of their feeding at night. During the day, if the plant is large enough, they might be hidden down inside of the whorl 
often they'll be buried in the soil residue or in the top layer of soil or underneath the residue. So when you start finding this cutting damage, you then have to go and excavate a little bit to actually find the larvae. Uh, the cutworm larvae, they have a little bit of a greasy appearance. They have kind of a sheen to them as if you sort of plastered them with Crisco or something like that. Uh, they're not actually slimy, but they do have that appearance and you can use that to help recognize cutworm larvae. Now there are some other early season types of damage that you can confuse cutworm damage for. One of the most common of these is going to be bird damage. So occasionally you'll have birds uproot the plant, typically targeting the, the corn seed or the remnants of the seed that are on there. You can see in this plant on the left, that bird has come through, pulled that plant up out of the ground and uprooted it. No cutworm larva is going to do that. They're not going to pull that plant up out of the ground. As you see here, they're going to cut it clean off. You also occasionally get hail, season, hail damage earlier in the season that can be confused for cutworm damage. And some of these plants are going to appear cut. Typically with that cutting, it's also going to be accompanied by wind damage, so some shredding of those leaves. Uh, you'll also find that those plants aren't always cut at the base of the plant. You might have a leaf cut off. You might have it cut a little bit higher than what you would expect with cutworm damage. Um, and of course, it just helps to be aware of where the storm cells are that have passed through. And if you had a severe storm a few days ago, that should be a pretty good indication that you might have some hail damage or some wind damage uh, and to avoid confusing that with cutworm damage. In terms of monitoring, there's a few things that we do in Illinois and that we recommend in Illinois. One, we do have statewide monitoring for black cutworm. So this is a migratory insect. They don't survive, except maybe in the very southern tip of Illinois. Most of our moths are going to come in from the southern states. And to determine the timing of those, we use pheromone traps. Now these are traps that are baited with a sex pheromone. So they're baited with a chemical that the female produces to attract a mate. Uh, so these traps, attract all males and when you find these males in the trap that's an indication that you have a flight going on. Once we find a significant flight in a county you can then project the cutting date or use projected temperatures to determine when those larvae are going to be large enough to cut plants and so you see for instance right now in Champaign County where I'm at we have a projected cutting date of May 28th. So right around May 28th is when we expect those larvae to be large enough to start cutting some plants. And so in a couple of weeks here, that's when we would really want to focus our efforts for cutworm scouting. And if you want to get updates on this and up-to-date information on the cutworm monitoring in Illinois, follow Kelly Estes on Twitter. That's at IL Pest Survey. So Kelly conducts a statewide pest survey that includes black cutworm, also includes the next pest that we'll be discussing, true army. And so you can follow her on Twitter and get updates of when we have projected cutting dates uh, for this particular pest. So you can follow the cutting dates and then after that, it's up to you to determine whether or not you have an issue in your field. So the infield monitoring, you really want to look for those cut plants. Um, from emergence through V5, after you get too much past V5, uh, plants able to outgrow that, they're not going to cut through that plant at that point and you're sort of safe from cutworm damage and you can move on to worrying about other things. Uh, when you identify that cutting, you want to dig through the, the top layer of soil and under the residue to find and identify those larvae. In terms of an economic threshold, uh, one thing fortunately with black cutworm, they're fairly easy to control and they're fairly easy to control with a fairly inexpensive uh, pyrethroid insecticide application. So our threshold is 5% of plants that are cut. So if you have 5% of your plants cut and you can still find those larvae out there, that is an important step. You wanna find the larvae, make sure they're still there. We don't wanna put out a revenge spray after those larvae have already come and gone. In addition to foliar insecticides, some of the seed treatments and above ground trait packages do provide control. 
just be aware that many of those packages only offer suppression. Um, so one resource that you have for the BT traits in particular is this handy BT trait table that I've linked at the bottom of your slide. You can use that to really determine the target insects for the trait packages that you have and use that to help you select a trait package based on what you're concerned with in a given year. The next insect pest I'd like to discuss is the, the true army worm. Similar in many respects to the black cut worm, this is a moth. Uh, this is a moth that primarily is going to be flying in from the southern states and looking for grassy weeds in which to lay its eggs. Oftentimes the situation you get into with army worm and with cutworm as well when you have a, a pest infestation is that moth had something early in the season that was attractive to her. Often that's a weedy field. Um, in some cases that could be a rye cover crop. It could be a wheat field next door, especially in the case of the true army worm. And then as that early food source starts to dry down, or if it's a weed when it's killed with a herbicide, those larvae still need something to feed on and then they'll often migrate over to the crop. So with true army worm, what you're really looking out for in terms of fields that are at risk are fields that have dense grassy vegetation, either within the field or near the field, and then especially after that dense grassy vegetation, uh, dries down or is killed in the case of weeds. One thing to look out for when you're identifying true armyworm larvae, um, they do have this net-like pattern on their head that you can see here. So that's a good way to distinguish these, especially early in the season when we don't have other armyworm species active in Illinois. Good way to distinguish these from cutworm and other caterpillars. In terms of the damage that army worms are going to do, this is where they differ somewhat from cut worms. So they're not going to go through and cut the plants. Now, if you have heavy enough army worm pressure, they can eat the foliage down to the ground level and stunt plants that way. They're a lot less likely to actually kill the plant, but they can stunt it pretty severely if they eat that foliage down to the ground level. You really want to watch, again, the edges of fields near wheat and grasses, and if you had grassy weeds in your field, potentially throughout the field in that situation. But those are the kind of situations that you're looking out for when we talk about true armyworm infestations early in the season. A nice clean stand of corn early in the season really isn't that attractive of an oviposition over site to those moths. It's that denser grassy vegetation that they really like to lay their eggs in. Our threshold for true army worm is a little bit higher because that damage is not as severe as the cutting damage that we see with black cutworm. But you ought to consider an insecticide application if you have 25% of the plants severely defoliated prior to V5. Again, once you get to that V5 stage, it can tolerate a lot more of that sort of damage. Um, and again, you want to make sure that you have both the damage and the larvae still in the field. Uh, you don't want to be putting out an insecticide application if those larvae have already come and gone on their merry way. A few other early season stand reducing pests that we deal with in Illinois. Uh, many of you are familiar with wireworms. These tend to be a problem um, in a few different scenarios, sometimes where you have year after year of grassy vegetation. So if you go into a pasture or go into a turf farm, for instance, and plant a crop after that situation, that's one case where you can favor wireworms. It's not always that clear why you end up with a wireworm infestation. One thing that's fairly unique about wireworms is that they have a multi-year life cycle. So you tend to develop these problem fields where if you have a problem with wireworms in one year, very likely you're going to have that problem again the next year, maybe the year after that, maybe the year after that. So that's something just to keep in mind. Once you find a field with a wireworm infestation, there's a pretty good chance you'll have that problem again the following year. Seed corn maggot, that's one that tends to be a problem where you have manure or green manure or other uh, sort of decaying vegetation or decaying organic material. 
in your field as those plants are coming up. With the seed corn maggot, the, the cooler temperatures really help it out when that seed starts to rot a little bit in the ground, when it's emergence is delayed, that's where seed corn maggot can really act on those seeds um, and reduce stand. Grape colastus is, is somewhat unique in that it's actually more of a problem, in fact, only a problem in corn that's rotated with soybean or another legume. So the beetle is going to lay its eggs in legumes in year one, and then when that's rotated to corn the following year, those larvae work their way up the soil profile and they feed on those corn roots and can reduce stand then uh, when you have a high population in rotated corn. Okay, moving on, let's talk a little bit about some of the early season insect pests that we see in soybean. I'd say the most conspicuous of these, the one we're the most used to seeing really year in and year out in soybean fields is going to be the bean leaf beetle. And this is one especially that we can see early on in the season, especially in some of those first soybean plants that emerge that put out a true leaf these tend to be almost like a magnet to these beetles, which are emerging from their overwintering sites and looking for a meal before they begin to lay their eggs. Often then, as you get more and more soybean fields starting to emerge around them, that will spread that population out a little bit. Uh, but you can, they can be somewhat alarming, especially on some of those first soybean fields to emerge in the spring. So the adults are often going to, they're going to move into those emerging seed soybeans during the seedling stages. They really like to feed on those, uh, those first unifoliate leaves, it seems like, as well as the early trifoliates as they come out there. Now the defoliation in and of itself that these insects do, is rarely going to be damaging. Soybean tolerates a lot of this kind of damage. In fact, our economic threshold is 30% defoliation prior to bloom. As ugly as that seedling on your screen looks right now, it's not at 30% at that point. 30% is a lot of defoliation. It takes a lot of that kind of damage to actually affect yield later on. Where you can get into an issue with bean leaf beetle is when they transmit bean pod model virus, uh, which is a, a disease in, in soybean that can actually be yield limiting. This disease tends to be somewhat localized. You tend to have problem fields with this. It can also be transmitted through seed, um, can be transmitted by the feeding of some other insects as well, some other beetles, but bean leaf beetle tends to be the most common uh, vector of this disease. You can see some of the symptoms of bean pod model virus on foliage here on this leaf, that, that modeling in coloration and that distortion of the leaf. You'll also see, of course, there's some feeding from an insect, very likely feeding from a bean leaf beetle on this particular plant. So that's something to learn to recognize and, and recognize especially if you tend to have a problem with bean pod model virus in a given field, in a given area. In terms of recognizing bean leaf beetle, they're a fairly conspicuous insect. They're one that we're very used to seeing they're always going to have this little triangle right behind what we call the pronotum here, but right behind the head. They'll always have that black triangle. And that's important to be able to recognize because sometimes they're spotted like this one is. Sometimes those spots won't be there. Sometimes they don't have spots on the wings. Sometimes they'll be this kind of reddish oranges coloration. Sometimes they're more straw colored. There's some variation in color as well but that little black triangle is always going to be there. In terms of the life cycle of the beetle, we have two generations per year. Since we're talking about early season pest management today, we're really talking about the overwintered generation. So the adults, um, they spend the winter as adults in residue, either in soybean residue or in woodlots and leaf residue nearby. And when they emerge in the spring, they then move into soybean fields and other legumes right away. So in terms of control of these, again, the defoliation typically is not going to be an issue. 
Where we're worried is where we have a history of bean pod model virus transmission. In situations like that, where you have a problem with bean pod model virus, control of the beetles may reduce transmission and preserve yield if you have high populations present, and especially if you have high populations present early in the field. So that's where you want to be concerned with bean leaf beetle management early. Uh, the defoliation in and of itself, again, typically cosmetic, uh, typically not going to cause any yield loss from that sort of damage. Um, because they're not going to reduce sand. Uh, it's not like some of these caterpillar pests we talked about in corn. They're not going to eat that plant all the way down to the base of the plant. And the plant comes back from that damage rather quickly in most cases. Now the last pest I want to talk to you about today actually isn't an insect. And I have to point that out right away or I'll get my entomologist card taken away from me. Um, slugs are a mollusk. Uh, so not an insect, but the entomologists get stuck with them because the kind of damage that they do is similar to an insect's damage in many ways. And these can impact stands early, and in fact, they're probably our most severe, we'll say, animal stand reducer, um, except in certain fields where you have a larger four-legged herbivores, deer, um, that do that. These are probably, in Illinois, the most significant stand-reducing pest early on in the season. Now, not being an insect, that's not just trivia for you. That's not just academic. Um, the consequence of that is that insecticides typically are not going to be effective for slug control. Uh, you have a few things here. One, an insecticide is designed to kill an insect, so it's designed to target the nervous system, usually, of an insect which is quite different from the, the system of a mollusk. Even more importantly, in many cases, the cuticle, the, the skin um, of an insect, so to speak, is very different from the skin of a slug. And in particular, a slug produces a mucus when it's disturbed that will often shed off or will say slime off any insecticide that comes into contact with it. So insecticides are not designed to penetrate this, they're designed to penetrate the cuticle of an insect. And so often in the rare cases where that insecticide is actually effective against a slug, you're not able to actually get it into that animal. In terms of the damage to soybean, it can be quite severe. They really like to feed on those germinating seeds and then on the cotyledons, as you can see here, they almost bore through those cotyledons in many cases, tear them up. In this picture, you can even see the slime trail that they leave behind. Very distinctive of slug damage here. There's nothing else really in terms of insects you're going to see that's going to do this type of damage to a soybean, soybean seedling. Obviously, if you get enough of this kind of damage, you've got stand loss. Um, and that's what we're trying to prevent when we talk about managing slugs. Um, so you get damage to stand both from damage to the germinating seeds and from that damage to the cotyledons after the seeds have emerged. Now slugs do feed on corn. Um, as you can see here, they do kind of a, a shredding damage on corn. Actually it looks very similar to if you grow hostas, the, the kind of damage you'll see from slugs on hostas. This damage is a lot less severe than in soybean. Um, it can lead to stand loss if you have very heavy infestations. In Southern Illinois, over the last few years, we've had some cases where we had some pretty heavy infestations. Especially in 2017, that seemed to be the, the worst year for slug damage in Southern Illinois, at least. Uh, a lot of horror stories about slugs from that particular season. Where you really have issues with slugs, they're favored very strongly by moisture. They do not do well when it's dry. Of course, we've had some wet springs over the last few years, and you look at 2020, and yeah, it's a little bit of a wet spring again this year. Uh, this can be compounded when you have cool conditions and you have slowing of that crop growth. Again, like we mentioned at the beginning of the talk, when you have that crop growth slowed, it just gives 
that animal more time to tee off on that plant while it's still vulnerable. There are some slug specific baits that are available that can be quite effective. Uh, so in this case, you don't have to worry about it penetrating the animal because uh, it's actually the, the poison is worked into a bait that the slugs feed on and if they ingest enough of that, they'll die. Those baits are fairly expensive. They're not readily available in Illinois in many cases. Um, in fact, we don't have a label for these in soybean uh, or for several of these in, in soybean, which is where perhaps we could really use them um, in, in some of these fields. So these haven't been a great option for us. That could change in the future. Um, certainly there are, some, there are some effective materials out there. But when we talk about managing slugs, we're really talking about cultural management. Anything to achieve that dry, warm seed bed that we're wanting. Of course, we want that every year. We don't always achieve that depending on the weather conditions. Um, one thing I will point out with, with slugs, you know, you know the conditions that favor these, cool, wet conditions. Those are also the conditions that favor replants for a lot of other reasons, right? And if you get into a situation where a replant is necessary because of slugs, you do want to make sure you allow that soil to dry out before you conduct that replant. Once you have that population there and you know you have that population there, it's going to be there until that soil has a chance to dry out, the temperatures have a chance to warm up, and you're giving the, those soybeans a chance to really come roaring up out of the ground and, and outrun that damage. What you don't want to get into a pattern of doing is planting, your field gets taken out by slugs, you replant again into wet conditions, they're still there and it gets taken out again. Um, again, insecticides aren't going to be effective, seed treatments aren't going to be effective against slugs. Uh, we have to rely on cultural management once we have this problem established uh, to achieve that warm, dry, seed bed. Another thing you want to be on the lookout for with slugs is open seed furrows. Again, a product of those wet conditions, uh, but something that can really favor stand loss from slugs. Those slugs kind of work their way down into that furrow and go from germinating seed to germinating seed, just taking out stand in a hurry when you get into that situation. That's all I have for now. I would be happy to take any questions that you have, either through this webinar or if you want to email them to me. I've given you my email address here. Uh, if you use Twitter, you're welcome to follow me on Twitter for in-season pest management updates. Thank you for your time, and I hope you've enjoyed this webinar. think of when you hear the term mental health. Some of us may associate mental health with mental illness, which includes clinical diagnoses such as depression and bipolar disorder. But did you know we all have mental health? Hi, I'm Josie Rudolphy. And I'm Courtney Cuthbertson. And we're both extension specialists with the University of Illinois. In today's mental health moment, we're going to explain what mental health is and why mental health is as important as physical health. If I asked you to rate your physical health, some of you might rate your physical health as excellent, and others may rate their physical health as good or fair. We recognize a spectrum of physical health, ranging from excellent to poor. Health is not only the absence of disease, but complete well-being, physically, mentally, and socially. When we think about mental health, this includes how we are doing emotionally, psychologically, and even socially. Our mental health affects how we feel, how we think, and how we act. Mental health is important across the lifespan from early childhood into older adulthood. Now, what if I asked you to rate your mental health? Like physical health, mental health exists on a spectrum. At times, we may find ourselves mentally unhealthy, not like, unlike being physically unhealthy. Imagine a time when you were feeling extremely overwhelmed, alone, or stressed. 
The ways we think, feel, and act may be very different during those times than they are when we do not feel overwhelmed, alone, or stressed, or even from those times when we feel very well. When we are at our most mentally healthy, we typically realize our full potential, can cope with stress in healthy ways, and work productively. Just like there are risk factors for physical health conditions, such as an improper diet or a sedentary lifestyle, there are risk factors for mental health conditions as well. These include family history of mental illness, stressful life situations or trauma, and social isolation. However, it's important to realize that while these conditions increase one's risk, they do not guarantee the development of mental health conditions. This underscores the importance of maintaining our mental health and preventing the onset of such conditions or learning how to manage with them. On the flip side of risk factors are protective factors or those things that help us to work towards or maintain being mentally well. For example, connecting with other people, supportive relationships with family, and having self-compassion all help. In the next several weeks, we challenge you to take note of your mental health. How would you rate your own mental health? Keep a record over time, maybe in a notes app on your phone, on a calendar, or in a journal or a notebook. How can you improve your mental health? This recording is the first of many in which we will explore strategies and activities to improve and maintain mental health. We hope you join us next time for another Moment for Mental Health.